And good evening, darling. The play we're performing for you this evening on Theatre Guild on the Air is called, and I never could understand why, All About Eve. Uh, true, there is an Eve in it, and what a part that is. But there's also a glamorous and brilliant leading lady of the theatre whose true identity has been kept a secret too long. <laughs> uh, tonight, darlings, <laughs> tonight, baby, intends to do something about that. <laughs> so to get on with it, we raise the curtain on All About Eve. <laughs> Adapted for us by Arthur Arendt and directed by Homer Pickett. Hello. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Addison DeWitt. I am a drama critic and columnist, which means I am essential to the theater. As ants to a picnic, or the boll weevil to a cotton field, the story probably properly begins one rainy night backstage at the current theater on Broadway. Seated in the star's dressing room are Max Fabian, the producer, and Lloyd Richards, the author of Miss Margot Channing's current smash hit. The curtain has rung down, the last bows have been taken, as the door opens and Miss Channing enters. Max, did you hear that applause, darling? Did you hear it? Lloyd, did you hear it? Oh, those curtain calls, those divine people, those divine, divine people. Ten months the play runs, Margot, and we still got standees. And why? Because they come to see you, darling. You, the most talented, the most inspired. Oh, thank you, darling. You're a wonderful producer, but... Let's not forget the play and the author. Thank you, Margot. True, there's always been that third act of yours, darling. It's lovely. Oh? A little pale, a trifle anemic, a perishing on its feet, in fact. No one else has ever noticed it? Naturally, darling, I shan't let them. That's what I'm there for, to tie up the loose ends into an enchanting Christmas package, all pretty bows and ribbons, so that everybody will forget to look inside. Now, just a minute. Lloyd, she's right. Third act. You slipped. Oh, my angel, you've seen that ever since we opened, haven't you, Max? And that reminds me, Max, this, uh, this publication, this so-called national magazine, whose advanced copy for this month I have here, look at it. Margot, respect. Fourteen million circulation they got, and your picture's on the cover. Max, you vowed, you swore, you gave me your solemn oath that you'd let me see the proof of that cover before it was printed. Where are your eyes, Mr. Fabian? Are these my features? I look like I'm an X-ray. <laughs> Besides which, the way they misquoted me. Why am I always misquoted, Max? Answer me, little man. Stop. Where are you going? Uh, business, Margot, darling. I must go right away and telephone on business. Excuse me. Yes, he'll telephone, all right, to his bookmaker. <laughs> well, Lloyd, how's the uh, new play coming? All right, I guess. The lead, Cora, she's, uh, she's still a girl of 20. Mm, 20 years. It isn't important. Well, don't you think it's about time it became important? How do you mean? Don't be evasive, darling. Lloyd, I'm not 20-ish. I'm not even exactly 30-ish. Margot, week after week to thousands of people, you're as young as you want. <laughs> as young as they want, you mean. And I'm not interested in what thousands of people think. No, just one person. The boyfriend, Bill. Lloyd, Bill is 32. He looked at five years ago. He'll look at 20 years from now. Oh, I hate men. <laughs> But don't worry, my friend. I'll play that part. I'll wear rompers and come in rolling a hoop if you like. Whatever happens, I will play that part. Hi, Margaret. Oh, hello, Karen. I believe that's your husband sitting on my sofa. Take him home, will you, darling? Lloyd, darling, I'm sorry to be late. Well, think nothing of it. Uh, Bertie, come out of that bathroom. Tell me where you hid my hat. It's on the floor under that junk you come from the cleaners. Say, you folks going to stay a while or can Miss Channing get dressed? That never stopped her before. Uh, Margot. Yes, darling? I brought someone back to see you. Uh, one of your admirers. If he's young enough to walk, send him in. <laughs> this is a girl. She's waiting outside. No, oh, dear. Margot, she worships you. She's seen every performance. It's like something out of a book. That book is out of print, darling. <laughs> Those days are gone. Fans no longer pull your carriage through the streets. They tear your clothes off instead. If you'd only see her, you're her whole life. You must have spotted her by now. She's always outside. You mean kind of a mousy trench coat and funny hat? Yes. Well, how could I miss her every night, every matinee? Oh, all right, Karen. Thanks, dear. I'll bring her in. Come in, Eve. Oh, I, I thought you'd forgotten all about me, Mrs. Richards. No, not at all. Margot, this is Eve Harrington. How do you do, my dear? Oh, hello, Miss Channing. And my husband. Hello. Mr. Richards. 
And this is my good friend and companion, Miss Bertie Coonan. Hi. Uh, won't you sit down, Miss Harrington? Uh, Eve, I was just telling Margot and Lloyd about how often you've seen oh, the play. Oh, yes. And I... Miss Channing, I've seen every performance. Really? Every yes. performance? <laughs> then we can safely assume you like the play. Oh, I'd like anything that Miss Channing played in. Well, how very sweet. I doubt you'd like her in The Hairy Ape. Well, Mr. Richard... <laughs> I believe it's part of Miss Channing's greatness, her ability to choose the best plays. And there's so little to choose from these days. Yes. Yeah. Well, what about the author's problem? Whom can we get to play what we write? Well, I understand that Hopalong Cassidy is looking for something. <laughs> Marco. No, but I'm curious, Miss Harrington. Why have you come to see the play so often? Oh, well, if I didn't see the play, I wouldn't have anywhere else to go. <laughs> well, there are other places. Oh, no, not with you in them, Miss Channing. Well, you must have some friends, a family, a home. No, I... I haven't. You haven't? No. You haven't? Well, then tell us all about it. Miss Channing. Yes, Bertie. You're taking the boyfriend to the airport tonight, don't forget. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Miss Harrington, you were saying... Well, it, it all started with your last play, Miss Channing. Remembrance. Oh. oh, did you see it here in New York? No, I didn't. I saw it in San Francisco. Oh. I, I went one night, the most important night of my life. Well, anyway, I, I found myself going the next night, and then the next, in every performance. And then when the show went east, well, I went east, and... Oh, gosh, this, this couldn't possibly interest you. Oh, but it does, really. Uh, suppose you start at the beginning, Eve. Well, you see, Miss Channing, my, my father was a farmer in Wisconsin, and, and farmers were poor in those days, so I quit school and went off to Milwaukee. I, I got a job as a secretary in a brewery. But there was a little theater group in town, and... Oh, I can imagine just what that meant to you, like a drop of rain on a desert. Oh, yes. And you see, that's where I met Eddie. He was a radio technician. Just before the war came, we got married. Eddie went into the Air Force, and they sent him to the South Pacific. Oh, you poor child. Well, one week he wrote me that he had a furlough coming up, and I'd saved my money and all my vacation time, so I just went to San Francisco to meet him. Uh-huh. Well, go on. Eddie wasn't there. Only a telegram said that Eddie wasn't coming at all. That Eddie was dead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just figured I'd stay in San Francisco, so I found a job, and his insurance helped me along, and, and then there were theaters in San Francisco, and, and one night, oh, one night, Margot Channing came to play in Remembrance, and I went to see it, and, well, you see, I, here I am. Hi, friends and lovers. Bill. Well, if it Bill. isn't Stanislavski. Bill, were you out front tonight? Listen, oh. Margot, listen, in 47 minutes, my plane takes off, and how do I find you? Not ready, looking like a junkyard? Thank you very much. <laughs> Listen, is this sabotage? Does my career in the cinema mean nothing to you? A junkyard, am I? My wonderful junkyard, baby. Think of the mystery and dreams you find in a junkyard. Kiss me. I love a psychotic. Mm. <laughs> now, look. Airlines have clocks even if... Why, hello. Who are you? My name's Eve. Hi, Eve. Hi. Hi. Well, I tried to introduce you, darling, but you were so impulsive. Miss Harrington, too, is a great admirer of yours. Imagine all this admiration in just one room. What? <laughs> Miss Channing, I guess I'd better be going. Miss Channing, Miss Richards, I, I'll never forget this life as long as I live. Oh, now, don't go, Eve. I'll tell you what, uh, we'll put a Stanislavski on his plane, huh? Then go somewhere and talk. Oh, well, if I... If I'm not in the way... Of course not. Oh, come along, Bertie, darling. Press on. I've got to get dressed. Oh, Bill, what time do you, do you get to Hollywood, huh? 10 a.m. Got any messages? Oh, what do you want me to tell Tyrone Power? Just give me my phone number. I'll tell him myself. <laughs> For the next few weeks, Eve followed Margot around like a little puppy, one with a strong police dog strain. She became her sister, lawyer, seamstress, companion, psychiatrist, and cop. Soon she had moved into a little spare room in Margot's house. And she was always backstage. Oh, Miss Channing, you haven't noticed my latest bit of interior decorating. Well, you've done so much, Eve, I hardly recognize this poor little old dressing room. <laughs> oh, what's new this time? Well, the curtains. I made them myself. Oh, oh, they're lovely, darling. Aren't they lovely, Bertie? Adorable. We now got everything a dressing room needs except a basketball hoop. Be quiet. Oh, he was very thoughtful of you, and I do appreciate it. I don't pay any attention to Birdie. No one does. But there were times when her appreciation was, shall we say, somewhat tempered, as when at three o'clock one morning her telephone rang. 
We are ready with your call to Beverly Hills. Uh, call, call. Is this Miss Margot Channing? That's right. Mm. We are ready with the call you placed for 12 midnight California time to Mr. Bill Sampson in Beverly Hills. I placed? Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Margo! What a wonderful surprise. Bill, Bill, I've gone crazy. But you're my girl, aren't you? And that I am. Then you're crazy. When are you coming back? I leave in a week. Pictures all wrapped up in a tin can. In a tin can or wrapped up in a Navajo blanket? I want you home. Quickly. So good night, darling, and sleep tight. Hey, hey, wait a minute. You can't hang up. You haven't even said it. Oh, darling, you know how much I do. But over the phone, baby, really, that's kid stuff. Kid stuff, Bernard. It doesn't happen every day. I want to hear it. And if you won't say it, sing it. Sing it? Sure. Sure, like the Western Union boys used to do. Bill. Oh, 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 Bill, it's your birthday. And who remembered it? Who was there on the dot at 12 midnight? Oh, happy birthday, darling. Atta, girl. I get a party when I get back, don't I? Of course. Birthday party and welcome home. Who knows? Cut it out, baby. I know all about the party. Eve wrote me. Eve wrote you? For sure. She hasn't missed a week since I left. But you know all about that. So you probably tell her just what to write. Good night, baby. I love you. Thanks very much. I'll check with Eve. What? I mean about the party. I love you too, darling. Good night, baby. You awake, Margo? Come in, Bertie, and turn on the light. Thought I heard voices. Sit down, Bertie. Give me a cigarette, darling. Okay, I don't mind if I have one myself. Bertie, you don't like Eve, do you? You want an argument or an answer? <laughs> an answer? No. Why not? Now you want an argument. She works hard? Night and day. She's loyal and efficient? Like an agent with one client. She thinks only of me, doesn't she? Well, let's say she thinks only about you anyway. How do you mean? Well, I'll tell you how. Like, well, like she was studying you. Like you were a play or a book or a set of blueprints. How you walk, talk, think, eat, sleep. Well, I'm sure that's very fabbing, Bertie, and I'm sure there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, Bill's coming home next week, Bertie. We'll give him a welcome home party Sunday night. Would you, uh, would you mind arranging it? No, I don't mind. And, uh, Bertie, uh, you might consult with Eve about things, okay, huh? Okay, I'll consult. Now, let's see, uh, uh get a pianist. Uh, get a flock of pianists. Now, Bill likes Horowitz and Rubenstein. Get both of them. <laughs> but don't pay more than Union Scale. Now, don't forget, buddy, the party's next Sunday night. Hello, Eve. Mm, Welcome to the party, Mrs. Richards. Well, how are things going with you, Eve? Happy? (laughs) That should be a new word for happiness. You know, Miss Channing's been so wonderful to me. (laughs) You've been good for her, too. Mrs. Richards. Yes? Isn't this awful? I... I'm about to ask you for another favor. And after all, you've done for me already. Nobody's done so much, Eve. What is it? Well, you you know, the other day, when he was here to lunch, I heard Mr. Fabian tell Miss Channing that her understudy was going to have a baby and and they'd have to replace her. You want to be Margot's new understudy? Oh, no, I don't even let myself think about it. But, you see, I do know the part so well and I... Oh, no. Gosh... What if I had to go on all of a sudden? No, no, no. I couldn't possibly. Oh, don't worry. Margot just doesn't miss performances. If she can walk, crawl, or roll, she plays. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, Mrs. Richards, you know, the show must go on. No, dear. Margot must go on. However, I I see no reason why you shouldn't be Margot's understudy. Then you will talk to Mr. Fabian about it? Of course. And you won't forget? I won't forget. Thank you. You all dressed, Miss Channing? Come in, Bertie, and zip me. How's the party going? And where the devil's Bill? He's late. Late for what, Miss Channing? He's been downstairs in the living room for 20 minutes. Well, I certainly think it's odd he hasn't even come up. What's he doing? Making dialogue with Miss Eve Harrington. Oh. Your zipper's all zip. Thanks, Bertie. I think it's time I made an entrance. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I do 
Well, that's what he said, Eve. He really said it. No, he didn't. (laughs) Oh, Margo. Hiya, baby. I was just telling Eve a Hollywood story. I hope I didn't kill the point. You heard it. You know the one uh, about the time when I looked through the wrong end of a camera finder? Eve, remind me to tell you about when I looked into the heart of an artichoke. Oh, I should love to hear it, Miss Channing. Uh, Some uh, snowy night in front of the fire, dear. In the meantime, would you mind checking about the hors d'oeuvres? It seems the caterer forgot them. The paint wasn't dry or something. (laughs) Yes, of course. Excuse me. Well, I had no idea you were here, Bill. Uh, I ran into Eve on my way upstairs. She told me you were dressing, so... That's my modest boy. Oh, well, we started talking. She wanted to know all about Hollywood. She seemed so interested. Now, she's a girl of so many interests. Yeah, it's a pretty rare quality these days. Uh, she's a girl of so many rare qualities. So she seems. Uh, so you pointed out. So often. So many qualities, so often. So loyal. Her loyalty, efficiency, devotion, warmth, affection. And so young. So young and fair. I get it. Get what? You know, somehow I can't believe you're making this up. It sounds like something out of an old Clyde Fitch play. Clyde Fitch, though you may not think so, was well before my time. Now listen. Margot, this is... Well, it's so laughable, it's funny. Is it? You know what I feel about this... Well, this age obsession of yours. And this ridiculous attempt now to whip yourself up into a jealous froth because I spend ten minutes with a stage-struck kid. Twenty minutes. Thirty minutes. Forty minutes. Stage-struck kid. She's a young lady of qualities, and I'll have you know I'm fed up with both the young lady and her qualities. Studying me as if, as, as if I were a play or a set of blueprints. How I walk, talk, think, eat, sleep. Now, how can you take offense at a kid trying in every way to be as much like her ideal as possible? Stop calling her a kid. It so happens there are particular aspects of my life to which I would maintain sole and exclusive rights and privileges. For instance, what? For instance, you. This is my cue to take you in my arms and reassure you, but I'm not going to. I'm too, too darn mad and... and... Guilty? No. Look, darling, there are certain characteristics for which you're famous on stage and off. These things are part of your equipment for getting along. You've got to keep your teeth sharp. All right. But don't sharpen them on me or on a kid like Eve. What about her teeth? She hasn't even cut them yet, and you know it. So when you start judging an idealistic, dreamy-eyed kid by the barroom Benzedrine standards of this megalomaniac society, I won't have it. Go on. Why stop now? Tell me that Eve Harrington has never by word, look, thought, or suggestion indicated anything to you but her adoration for me and her ecstatic happiness in our being in love. Right. And to intimate anything else just spells a, a paranoid insecurity of which you should be ashamed. Cut. Press it. What happens in the next reel? Do I get dragged off screaming to the snake? Oh, Margo, for the love of Mike. <laughs> I've seen you like this before. Are you all through or just beginning? Through? Why, I haven't even begun. Fasten your seatbelt, lover. It's going to be a bumpy night. <laughs> I just played Liebestrom, Miss Channing. Play it again, darling. That was the fourth straight time. And this will make the fifth straight time. I'm just crazy about Liebestrom. Margo. Da, da, da. Here I am, darling. Fetch me a martini from that tray, please. Fetch me two. Da. Margo. Margo. Some of your guests are wondering when they'll be permitted to view the body. <laughs> Where has it been laid out? It hasn't been laid out, darling. We haven't finished with embalming. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you're looking at it. The remains of Margot Channing sitting up. <laughs> it is my last wish to be buried sitting up. Wouldn't you uh, feel more natural taking a bow? Ah, uh, Bill, you know nothing about feelings, natural or unnatural. Your guests are also wondering whether the music couldn't be a shade more on the, shall we say, happier side. If my guests do not like it here... I suggest they accompany you to the nursery, where I'm sure you will all feel more at home. Margo, Margo, I must speak to you. Speak, Max. You got any bicarbonate of soda in the house? Of course I've got some bicarbonate of soda in the house. I mean, I've got some. There's a box in the pantry. We'll put your name on it. Max Fabian, it'll stay there always. <laughs> Just for you, Max. You hear that, Bill? I got friends. 
I love you, Max. I really mean I love you. Go to the pantry. <laughs> well, Mr. Sampson, shall we stroll among the guests? Margot, baby. Your arm, lover. Look, now, I think you've had enough fire water for tonight. Your arm. Tell me, lover, is that a, a vulture over there dipping his beak in the lobster salad? Oh, that ain't no vulture, lady. That's Addison DeWitt. Ah, how enchanting. I hope he's got a fish allergy. Well, if that isn't Karen. Hello, Margo. And dearest Lloyd and little Eve. Oh, is there anything I can get for you, Miss Channing? A, a drink, perhaps? Uh, no, thank you. And don't get up. And please stop acting as if I were the queen mother. Uh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't... Miss... Margot. Outside of a beehive, your behavior would hardly be considered either queenly or motherly. You're in a beehive, pal. <laughs> Didn't you know? They're all busy little bees full of stings, making honey day and night, aren't we? Honey. <laughs> Margot, now really. Please don't play governess, Karen. I haven't your unyielding good taste. I wish I'd gone to Radcliffe, too. But my father wouldn't hear of it. He needed help at the notions counter. Come on, come on. Cut it out, Margot. Listen to me, Bill. This is my house, not a theater. In my house, you're a guest, not a director. As for me, I'm going to bed. Bill, you be the host. It's your party. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Welcome home. And we who are about to die salute you. Hey, wait a minute, baby. You need any help? To put me to bed? To tuck me in, turn out the lights, and tiptoe quietly out? Eve would, wouldn't you, Eve? Why, yes, certainly, if you'd like me to, Miss Channing. I wouldn't like. Good night, everybody. But, Margot, your guests... What do they need me for? The drinks are still holding out. If not, Eve will fix everything. She fixed Bill's welcome home birthday party. Ah, a night to go down in history. <laughs> Like Custer's last stand. <laughs> like the Johnston flood. <laughs> like the assassination of Junior Caesar. <laughs> You are listening to All About Eve, produced by the Theater Guild on the Air, presented by the United States Steel Corporation. Starring Tallulah Bankhead as Margot, with Beatrice Pearson as Eve and Kevin McCarthy as Bill Sampson, and featuring Mary Orr as Karen Richards. What was it the wise man said? This too will pass away. And so two weeks later, all was well again with Bill and me. It is at this point, friends, that I must once again call attention to myself, Addison DeWitt. You see, I had somehow become acquainted with a certain exotic blonde, Miss Claudia Caswell, a graduate of the Copacabana School of Dramatic Art. And in a weak moment, I had promised her an audition with Max Fabian, the Broadway producer. Okay, Addison. You mention my play in your column every day for one month, and I do it. Two weeks. One month. Three weeks. One month, and I get Margot Channing to read with her. Margot? She'll do it for me. Is it a deal? It's a deal. And so the day of the audition arrived. It was a Friday. I was smoking a cigarette in the deserted lobby when Margot came into the theater, late as usual. Well, Addison, why so remote? I should think you'd be at the side of your protege, lending her moral support. The audition, my dear Margot, is over. Over? But can't be. I've come to read with her. That audition was called for 2.30. It is now nearly 4. Oh, is it really? Huh. Well, I must start wearing a watch. Uh, who read with Miss Caswell? Naturally enough, your understudy, Miss Eve Harrington. Eve? My understudy? You mean you didn't know she was? Oh, yes, of course I knew she was. I... It just slipped your mind. How, um, how was Miss Caswell? Frankly, I don't remember. Margot, as you know, I have lived in the theater as... Uh... Yeah, as a Trappist monk lives in his fate, I know. Hmm. I have no other world, no other life. 
And once in a great while, I experience that moment of revelation for which all true believers wait and pray. You were one such moment. Gene Eagles, another. Hayes, Cornell. And now, Eve Harrington. Brilliant, vivid, something made of music and fire. I see. How nice, Alison. In time, she'll be what you are, Margot. A mass of music and fire, that's me. Tell me, was Bill swept away too, or were you too full of revelation to notice? Bill didn't say, but Lloyd was beside himself. He listened to his play as if someone else had written it, he said. It sounded so fresh, so new, so full of meaning. Well, how nice for Lloyd. And Eve, and everybody. Excuse me, Alison, dear, but I'm going backstage and have a word with all those happy people. Oh, there you all are. Well, shall we start the audition? Oh, hello, Eve. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Channing. The audition's all over, Marco. What's all over? Eve read with Miss Caswell. Eve? Well, how enchanting. Where did you get the idea of having Eve? She's your understudy, isn't she? Eve? Eve, my understudy? Oh, Miss Channing, I can't tell you how glad I am that you arrived so late. Really? Why? Well, if you'd come in in the middle, I, I wouldn't have dared to go on reading. I simply wouldn't have dared. What a pity, all that fire and music being turned off. <laughs> Fire and music. You wouldn't understand. Oh, now, Miss Channing, believe me, I was dreadful. I was awful. I have no right to be anyone's understudy, much less yours. I'm sure you underestimate yourself. Doesn't she, Lloyd? Margot, you'd have been proud of her. She was a revelation. Really? To you too, Lloyd? Look here, what do you mean? Eve, go away in my office. Oh, yes, Mr. Fagan. I mean, among other things, that it must have been a revelation to have your 24-year-old character played by a 24-year-old actress. So she says. That's beside the point. It's right to the point. Also, that it must have sounded so new and fresh to you, so full of fire and music. Addison. Oh, so you've been talking to that venomous fishwife, Addison DeWitt. In this case, as trustworthy as the world almanac. You knew when you came in that the audition was over, that Eve was your understudy, playing that childish little game of cat and mouse. Not mouse. Never mouse. <laughs> if anything, rat. <laughs> Margot, you have a genius for making a barroom brawl out of a perfectly innocent misunderstanding at most. Perfectly innocent men have been hanged for this. I'm lied to a cat behind my back, accused of reading your silly dialogue in actual Please, children, may I say a word? No, you keep out of this, Max. Go over there and sit down next to Bill. Look how calmly he takes everything. But after all, why should one expect anything else? Ha! Huh, directors. Go on, my sweet. Don't stop for me. I wouldn't think of stopping Actresses, you. stars. They never die. They never change. You can change this star any time you want. For a new, fresh, exciting one with built-in fire and music. Any time you want, starting with tonight's performance. Did you hear that, Max? Margot, please. This is for lawyers to talk about. You have a contract. Are you threatening me with legal action, Mr. Fabian? Are you breaking the contract, Miss Channing? Answer my question. Are you threatening me? Who am I to threaten? I'm a dying man. What? Speak up! I can't hear you! I am a dying man! <laughs> Not until the last drugstore sold his last pill. <laughs> Do you have any other little thing on your little mind, Mr. Richard? Only this, Miss Channing. It's about time the piano realized that it has not written the concerto. Tell me, just when exactly does an actress decide that they're her words she's saying and her thoughts she's expressing? Usually at the point when she's got to rewrite and rethink them to keep the audience from leaving the theater. Oh, I'm going out and get drunk. Coming, Mac. I've come. Well... Well, indeed. And you, Herr Director, you, I take it, are the Paderewski who plays his concerto on me, the piano. You got a match, baby? I seem to be fresh out. No, I have not got a match, and if I did have a match... And by the way, where is Princess Fire and Music? <laughs> who? The kid. <laughs> Junior. I guess she snuck out when you launched the typhoon. Ah, oh. I must have frightened her away. I wouldn't be surprised. Sometimes you frighten me. Poor, poor little flower just dropped her petals and folded her tent. Look, 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 baby. The gong rang. The fight's over. Calm down. I will not calm down. Exactly what do you all take me for? Little Nell from the country? 
Imagine my understudy for a week, and I don't know anything about it. Now, don't get carried away. She shows up for an audition when everyone knew I'd be here and gives a performance. Out of nowhere, she gives a performance full of fire and music and whatnot. It was carefully rehearsed, I have no doubt, over and over and over, full of those Bill Sampson touches. Now, listen, Margot. I'm sick and tired of these paranoid outbursts. Paranoid? I said listen. Now, you've got to stop hurting yourself and me by these paranoid tantrums. That word again. I don't even know what it means. Well, it's about time you found out. <laughs> now, look, baby, I love you. <laughs> You're a beautiful and intelligent woman. Uh, a great actress with every reason for happiness. Every night, hundreds of people love you. They want you. They, well, you belong. And yet you permit the slightest action of a kid. Kid. A, a kid. A kid like Eve to turn you into a hysterical, screaming harpy. Now, once and for all, stop. Bill, it's quite obvious you're not a woman. <laughs> I've been aware of that for some time. Now, come on, come on, forget it, will you? And buy me... Come on out, I'll buy you a drink. Mr. Sampson, I admit I may have seen better days. But I'm still not to be had for the price of a cocktail like a salted peanut. <laughs> Margot... What can we do to make peace between us? Would it do if we got married? I certainly wouldn't marry you just to prove something. Well, you've had so many reasons for not wanting to marry me. Tell me, what's behind all this? I want you to love me, Bill, not Margot Channing. Me, do you understand me? If you can't tell them apart, how can I? Now, Margot, I... Oh, I've got a feeling that this was my last try. I mean it. I can't think of anything else to do. I wish I could. Goodbye, Margo. Bill! Yes? Where are you going? To find Eve? That does it. So long. Every reason for happiness. Every night, hundreds of people love you. They want you. You belong. <laughs> <laughs> That evening, after Lloyd came home and told Karen about his brawl with Margot, things began to happen. Karen was hopping mad, at Margot, of course. And thinking about it, Karen got an idea. She went to the phone. Now listen to me. Oh, yes. You'll get your chance on Monday night. Monday. As the understudy, you'll go on in Margot's place. Monday, but why? Because Margot won't be able to. She won't even be at the theater. She'll be at my place in the country. Yes, I know she's going there on Sunday, but what? How? What? Uh, I tell you, I'll see to it. Goodbye now, Eben. And good luck. And so Karen persuaded Margot to stay in the country until late Monday afternoon. And then, halfway to the station to catch the last train in time to get to the theater... What's the trouble, darling? Why have you stopped? I... I don't know, Margot. Karen, look at your thing about there. You're, you're gay. You're, you're out of gas. Oh, no. Margot, I'm simply desolated. The train, Karen. How will I make a nice performance? Fabian speaking. Oh, uh, Max, darling. Oh, what have I done? I can't get over it. Will you ever forgive me, darling? I'm simply afraid by Max. Margot, uh... The box office. Did you have to pay me any refunds? Oh, Max, I could have let the audience down. I Margo, can't. listen. I've but... never let this thing in my life go. I never let I've been dying in California, especially. Margo! Yes, darling, I'm so upset. What we are you? giving a performance. A performance? Your understudy is on. <laughs> Well, kid, you can be proud of yourself. Who are you proud of me, Bill? Well, I'll admit I was worried when Max called me and said Margot didn't Oh, no, show. you shouldn't have worried, Bill. But you did it, Junior. <laughs> you know, with work and patience, you'll be a fine actress, if that's what you want to be. Is that what you want me to do, Bill? I'm talking about you and what you and want. And so am I. What? Oh, don't run away, Bill. From what would I be running? Oh, you're always after the truth on the stage. Now, what about off, Bill? I'm for it. Then face it, I have since that very first night here in this very same dressing room. Ah. Ah. You're quite a girl, Eve. Mm, you think? I'm in love with Margot. Hadn't you heard? Oh, well, you hear all kinds of things. Of course, I'm only human. Are you? The only thing, uh, what I go after, I want to go after. Oh, Bill. I don't want it to come after me. 
Oh, no, Bill. Don't... Oh, don't cry, kid. Don't cry. Just score it as an incomplete forward pass. Now, don't talk to me like that, making me out some kind of a, a cheap tart. I don't want to make you out anything. And you said that word. I didn't. May I come in? Oh, come in, Madison. I was just reading. Go on, kid. I take it Mr. Sampson was felicitating you on your magnificent performance. Oh, well, it's, it's just a carbon copy of Miss Channing's. Miss Harrington, I think the time has come for you to shed some of your humility. Me? Gracious, I'm less than nobody. I am somebody. What do you mean? I'll tell you all about it, my dear, and what it means to you over a bite of supper. You just go in and change. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'll take care of the rest. Well, Miss Harrington and I had supper that night. And the next day, my column telling all about Eve appeared. And within the hour, Karen was at Margot's apartment. But did you read it all? I couldn't. I thought I'd be sick. Permit me to go over some of my favorite bits. A coute. That means listen. I quote, Miss Eve Harrington had much to tell, and these columns shall report her faithfully about the lamentable practice in our theater of permitting, shall we say, mature actresses to continue playing roles requiring a youth and a vigor of which they retain but a dim memory. That's me she was talking about. I just can't believe Eve said that. Karen, in this rat race, everybody's guilty until they're proved innocent. One of the differences between the theater and civilization. Well, she won't get away with it. Nor will Alison DeWitt and his poison. Margot. Oh, Bill, hi. Uh, I came as soon as I read that piece of filth. Ran all the way. Oh, oh, oh that piece in the paper, why, Bill? Did you think I minded? it? <laughs> I am unruffled, unmoved, and uh, inviolate, shall we say. Margot, you're a great kid. Great. But I'm your director, remember? I'm the guy who knows about you. And the next night, everybody who was anybody uh, was at the stork club. Bill had a private party at his table. Attention, friends. Especially you, Lloyd. Quote, Tonight... Miss Margot Channing gave a performance in your cockamamie play, the like of which I have never seen before and expect rarely to see again. Unquote. He does not exaggerate. Unquote. You were great. Ah, oh, that's my point. It's been quite a night, huh? I understand that my understudy, a, 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 a Miss Harrington, has given her notice. Oh, too bad, too bad. And now, attention, a toast to Margot. To my bride to be. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, Margo. Four things. When's it to be, Margot? Uh, 10 a.m. at City Hall tomorrow. At City Hall? Why, City? Oh, it's only for the license. There's a three day wait. Blood test, you know. Darling, I'll marry you if it turns out you haven't got any blood at all. <laughs> what are you going to wear, dear? Oh, something simple a string of pearls, fur coat over a nightgown. No. <laughs> Um, excuse me, Mrs. Richard. Oh, uh, yes, waiter? A note for you. Oh, thank you. Well, if this doesn't beat... Here, Margot, read this. Dear Karen, please forgive me for butting in, but it's most important that I speak with you. Meet me in the ladies' room. Eve. I, under- I understand that she's the understudy in there now. <laughs> what gall. Karen, in all the years... In all the years of our friendship, I have never let you go to the ladies' room alone. <laughs> but now I must. I am bursting to know what goes on in that feverish little brain waiting in there. Go along, darling. Hurry up, hurry up, and hurry up back. Do. Eve, I wish I could believe you. You didn't really say any of those things. They were all Addison. Oh, you've really got a very low opinion of me, haven't you? Oh, Eve, don't cry. I just wish I'd never met him. I'd like for him to be dead. Eve, I, I don't think you mean to cause unhappiness. And believe it or not, if, if there's anything I can do. Yes. 
That there is something. Yes? Your husband's new play. What I've read that? it. Oh, have you? Yes. Addison says that I must play Cora. It's just the part I need for my career. What? Margot's part? Over my dead body, Eve. That won't be necessary. Karen, Addison knows how Margot happened to miss that performance. It's quite a story. Addison can make quite a thing about it. Imagine how snide and vicious he could get and still write nothing but the truth. You know, I had a time persuading him last... Oh. That's right. You better sit down, Karen. You look a bit wobbly. And your friendship with Margot, your deep, close, warm friendship... What would happen to it, do you think, if she knew the cheap trick that you'd played on her and for my benefit? And then you and Lloyd, how long, even in the theater, before people would forget what had happened and ever trust you two again? No. No, it would be so much easier on everyone concerned if I were to play Cora. And you know, it would be so much better theater, too. You do all that just for a part in a play? Well, you know, I'd do much more for a part that good. Karen. Oh, uh, nothing much. Uh, she apologized. Uh, with tears? <laughs> yes. Oh, but not right away. First, the business of fighting them off. Uh, chin up, a stout fellow. Uh, check. Very classy stuff. Lots of technique. Uh, groom. Groom. Huh? Oh, you mean me? Naturally. May I have a wedding present? What would you like, Texas? I would like everybody to shut up about Eve. Just shut up about Eve. That's all I would like. Tonight, I'm happy. Isn't this a lovely room? The cub room. What a clever name. Where the elite meet. <laughs> Never have I seen so much elite. And all with their eyes on me, waiting for me to crack that little gnome over the noggin with the bottles. <laughs> but not tonight. I'm forgiving tonight. Even Eve, I forgive you. Um, groom. Yes, dear. You know what I'm going to be? A cowboy? A married lady. With a paper to prove it. I'm going to have a home. Not just a house, I'm afraid to stay in. And a man to go with it. Oh, you'll be there, won't you, groom? Oh, often enough to keep the franchise. A four square, upright, downright, forthright, married lady. That's for me. And no more make-believe. Off stage along. From now on, I play grown-up women only. I might even play a mother, huh? Only one child, of course, and not over eight. a girl. <laughs> oh, I had something else. Lloyd, Karen... Will you promise not to be angry with me? Baby, tonight I couldn't be, no matter what. Uh, then listen. I don't want to play Cora in your new opus. What? Now, wait a minute, darling. Don't get so touchy. I haven't said it isn't a great part in a fine play. I think it is. But not, not for me anymore. Not a four-square, upright, downright, forthright, married lady. What's your being married got to do with it? It means I've finally got a life to live. I don't have to play parts I'm too old for. Just because I've got nothing to do with my nights. No, Lord, darling. No, Cora. Now, I know, I know you made plans, but I'll make it up to you. Believe me, I will. <laughs> Karen, what's the matter? <laughs> Karen, what are you laughing at? <laughs> oh, darling, you must be awfully funny. <laughs> In fact, it's contagious. <laughs> Needless to mention, when Lloyd's new play went into rehearsal, Eve got the part of Cora. I presume it was a mere oversight that Lloyd neglected to consult Karen about it. The denouement, as we say in the theatre, took place opening night in Eve's hotel room, a few hours before the curtain went up. Hmm? Come in. Oh, Miss Karen, thank you so much for coming. I was so afraid that... I wouldn't come? Mm-hmm. I admit I was docile, but I'm uh, dying to know what's agitating that feverish little brain this time. Oh, well, won't you wish me luck on my opening night? For what it's worth, I wish you luck. I thank you. Now, what else? Well, I... I wanted to tell you... Well, that is, I... I wondered if you'd care to do something for one of your dearest friends. One of my dearest mm -hmm, friends? I'm referring to Karen. It's also about Lloyd. So, it's about Karen and Lloyd. Continue, pray. By all means, continue. Margot, Lloyd and I have come to... Well, to know each other. You know, understand each other during these weeks of rehearsal. And we know Lloyd is a wonderful man, Margot. Yes, I know. And commercially, the most successful playwright in America. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that, shall we? Margot, Lloyd is going to leave Karen. 
What do you mean? He loves me. He's going to marry me, marry me. Do you understand that? Nothing can stop that, I promise you. Nothing? Mm-hmm. Then what did you want to see me about? Well, it's just that... Oh, well. Now, look, why should there be any unpleasantness? Aren't we civilized? We're adult. Now, you could speak to Karen Margot. You could tell her that nothing in the world that she might do or say will prevent Lloyd and me from going on... I see. Nothing that Karen can do. But what about what I could do? You? What could you possibly I could speak to Lloyd. (laughs) I could say to Lloyd, uh, Lloyd, darling, you love Eve Harrington. But do you love Gertrude Kleinhauser? That is your name, isn't it? What of it? I could continue that. It's quite true, Lloyd, that our Eve, or Gertrude, once worked in a brewery. But life in the brewery was apparently not as dull as she has pictured it to us. For example, the boss's wife had him followed by detectives. She never proved a thing, not a thing. That $500 brought you straight to New York, didn't it? Well, she was a liar, a complete liar. Answer my question. Once you paid to get out of town, and you've never been to San Francisco, so how could you have ever seen me act out there? Also, there was no Eddie, no pilot, and you've never been married. That was not only a lie, but an insult to dead heroes and to women who loved you. Gout! 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 Eve... Your arm is much too short for that gesture. Besides, it hasn't been used since Olga Petrova. Get out! <laughs> Go on! And don't... Don't throw that vase, dear. Don't even put your little hand on it. There. That's better. Goodbye, darling. Oh, get out! Oh. Addison. My, my, my. Temper, temper, Eve. Why is this ersatz porcelain strewn across the floor? <laughs> but now, now, what do you want here? I have been waiting for Miss Channing to depart. You knew she was here? I surmised she would be. Oh, that woman, Addison, she's a liar, a liar, pure and simple. Why, not a word that comes out of her mouth is the truth. That shouldn't bother you, Gertrude Kleinhauser. Oh, I see she's... she's told you, too. No, dear. I told her. You told her? My problem was how best to use this odd information that I had garnered. Printed in my column? No, that wouldn't... wasn't quite the answer. Since, well, my dear, surely you've gathered, somehow you must have known. Known what? You and I were meant for each other, Eve. You and I? We have a lot in common. A contempt for humanity... Insatiable ambition, talent. <laughs> you <laughs> and I. <laughs> oh no, you You're don't. Very <laughs> Remember, as long as you live, my dear, never to laugh at me, at anything or anyone else, but never at me. Do you understand? Answer me. Yes, Addison. Good. Now go take your nap, and good luck for tonight. I won't play tonight, not possibly. I couldn't go on. Couldn't go on? My dear, you'll give the performance of your life. And as you know, she did. And months later, when the Sarah Sidden Society gave its annual award for the best acting performance of the season... The winner was introduced by Margot Channing. Ladies and gentlemen, you know it is the custom of the Sarah Siddons Society that the winner of the previous season's award shall introduce the actress who is to be honored this season. You see before me the cherished plaque that it was my good fortune to win last year. And beside me, the supremely gifted young lady, true a newcomer among us, but one so talented that in a single year she has risen so high as to be your new award winner. I have no doubt we shall never forget her, Miss Eve Harrington. And so in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, although I am going to Hollywood next week, I don't want you to think that I'm leaving you. Now, how could I? For my heart is here in the theater, and 3,000 miles are too far away to be away from my heart. I'll be back to claim it. And soon. That is, if you want me back. Beautiful, Eve. 
beautiful. Oh, thanks, Matt. And, well, Margot, how did you like my speech? Very nice, Eve. Only one thing. Hmm? I wouldn't worry too much about your heart. You can always put that award where your heart ought to be. Come on, Bill, let's go home. Fallen on the Theater Guild on the Air production of All About Eve, sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. We express our thanks to our star, Tallulah Bankhead, as Margot, and to Beatrice Pearson as Eve and Kevin McCarthy as Bill Sampson. Our thanks also to the other members of our cast as Lloyd Richard, Don Briggs, as Addison DeWitt, Alan Hewitt, as Bertie Coonan, Florence Robinson, as Max Fabian, Stefan Schnabel, as the pianist, Reginald Mason and as the telephone operator, Prudence Trusdell. Joseph L. Mankiewicz wrote the screenplay All About Eve, which was based on a short story by Mary Orr, who was featured tonight as Karen Richards. And now let's hear from Basil Rathbone, just a word about next week's play. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Next week on Theatre Guild on the Air, it is my privilege to join Alan Webb and Margaret Phillips in a performance of The Winslow Boy, Terence Radigan's heart-tugging comedy drama... Of an English boy accused of petty theft and the repercussions that aroused the world. We sincerely feel that you will be richly rewarded if you listen. Thank you. Tonight's presentation of All About Eve was through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producer of the Technicolor motion picture The Snows of Kilimanjaro, starring Gregory Peck, Susan Hayward, and Ava Gardner. The Theatre Guild on the Air is under the supervision of Lawrence Langner and Teresa Halbert with our minor Marshall executive producer. As Mark Smith is editor, music was composed and conducted by Harold Levy. Your announcer has been Norman Brokenshire. The United States Steel Corporation hopes that you'll be with us next Sunday at the same time. Tonight, hear Dragnet over NBC.